John chapter 2, verses 12 through 25, the story of Jesus' cleansing of the temple. The first section in John's Gospel is called the Book of Signs. It's the public ministry of Jesus. And the first section that combines various pericope or stories together is this section of John 2, 1 through chapter 4, verse 42, or as some would have it, all the way to the end of the chapter, verse 54. This uh, section seems to relate these stories to each other with the word new, and in also some other ways, as I will point out shortly. So, for example, the first story is the story of Jesus turning the water into wine in Cana. And this then we could call the new wine of purification. That's followed then by the pericope that we're looking at, where Jesus cleanses the temple. And the emphasis falls on the fact that Jesus is offering a new temple to the one that everyone is standing before uh, in Jerusalem during the Passover at in chapter 2, verses 12 to 25. That's followed by the story in Jerusalem of Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. And famously, we hear that we need new birth or birth from above. And the uh, verse 5 says that you must be born of water and the Spirit. And so we have not only the image of new birth and water, but we also have the image of spirit uh, developed in this section. And then we have in chapter 4, 1 through 42, the story of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman and her dialogue with Jesus. And there we learn of a new water that Jesus offers that's different from the water from that well that Jacob had provided for the people in the region. Jesus offers a new living water, and then that relates to a new worship. You will worship neither here at Mount Gerizim or in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, but you will worship in spirit and in truth. And so this section has to do with the new worship that uh, is being offered now uh, through the ministry of Jesus. Now, it may be that we should add the final story in chapter 4 to this theme of newness. Uh, the story of the official who comes from Capernaum to Jesus in Cana. And there Jesus uh, gives life to this son of the official who's on his deathbed. Is this also another bit of newness, a new life offered? Um, and so it, whether or not we take that last story with the theme, we then can see that this whole section holds together with the new ministry that Jesus is offering vis-a-vis -vis Judaism. It's appropriately then the very first section in the public signs section, the public ministry section, of Jesus in John's Gospel. Looking a little bit more closely at structure and themes, we can see that there is a relationship between the story of the uh, Jesus turning the water into wine in Cana in chapter 2, 1 through 11, and Jesus cleansing the temple in chapter 2, 12 through 25 that follows the first story immediately. So, as we've already noted, something new and better is being offered. But there's also a little something more there between the two of these. With the uh, story of the uh, miracle at Cana of turning water into wine, we also have a possible Eucharistic theme where Jesus is offering a cleansing through the wine which is in the Eucharist, a symbol for the blood of Christ. The new purification that Jesus is going to offer is his own blood on the cross. And related to that, then, we have the cleansing of the temple 
where Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And the text makes clear that you understand that he's talking about his own body, his death and resurrection. In three days he will be raised from the dead. And so here then we have really a Eucharistic theme from 2, 1 through the end of the second story in verse 25. We have the wine and we have his body uh, that is providing this newness. As Jesus provides a better purification for the Jews, chapter 2, verse 6, so he provides a better sacrifice, his own body, than the temple. And both of these, the wine and the body, are going to be uh, what provides the purification for uh, the people. Uh, this purification is a purification that is especially associated with the temple. And Jesus' critique of the temple is not just about the uh, those buying and selling and uh, turning the house of the Lord into a marketplace, but it's also about um, providing a purification that works, a purification in his body. In chapter 2, 12 to 25, we also see a link with the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3, 1 and following. Jesus' working of signs is the link. The Jews ask Jesus what sign he will do that they may understand his cleansing of the temple in chapter 2, verse 18. And many believed on Jesus in Jerusalem because of the signs that he did, we read in chapter 2, verse 23. And so when we come to the story of Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 2, we see that Nicodemus recognizes that God must be with Jesus for him to do the signs he was doing in Jerusalem. Note here that we have reference to the second sign that Jesus did in uh, chapter 4, right at the end with the official son. But here we have reference to the signs. So we have more than one sign in view before the second sign is mentioned. Uh, now that may be because the focus is that the second sign is not the second sign Jesus did, but the second sign that he did in the region of the Galilee, uh, not in Judea. Uh, so that could be one, of the, one explanation for the difference. Uh, in any case, this emphasis is on signs here, and it's really why we call this whole section from chapter 2 through chapter 12, the book of signs, Jesus' public ministry. In chapter 3, 1, through 1 and following then, just as Jesus offers a new wine for purification and a new temple in his own sacrifice, he offers new life by being born again to those who believe in him and receive the spirit that he gives. There are several Old Testament passages that we should look at as we seek to interpret the story of Jesus' cleansing of the temple. And one of these is Zechariah chapter 14, verses 20 to 21. We read there, On that day there shall be inscribed on the bells of the horses, Holy to the Lord, and the cooking pots in the house of the Lord shall be as holy as the bowls in front of the altar. And every cooking pot in Jerusalem and Judea shall be sacred to the Lord of hosts, so that all who sacrifice may come and use them to boil the flesh of the sacrifice. And there shall no longer be traitors in the house of the Lord of hosts on that day. So we see two things there that are also present in the story in John chapter 2. Firstly, the future age will not distinguish sacred places. What is restricted as sacred within the house of the Lord will extend to everything in the house of the Lord, will extend to all Jerusalem and Judea. And then secondly, there will be uh, no making of things that are sacred to be common uh, 
uh, the, there will not be people trading in the house of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Uh, note that the house of the Lord language in Zechariah is my father's house in John chapter 2, verse 16. This theme of uh, no sacred places, of course, is also present most memorably in John 4, 23, where Jesus says to the Samaritan woman at the well, that worship will not continue at Mount Gerizim or in Mount Zion, but it will be uh, in spirit and in truth. In this cleansing of the temple by Jesus, we have a critique of the temple itself. Uh, there's not just the critique of those buying and selling in the temple, but of the temple and its uh, function. And the critique of the temple is not unique to Jesus and his disciples the early and the early church. Uh, the critique of the temple as inadequate was also made by the people who lived at Qumran. And in the Qumran literature, we see this criticism. But also consider Malachi chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. There we read this. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the, in the days of old and as in former years. So the event at the temple is a cleansing event, as we see from Malachi. Jesus cleansing the worship of Israel. Another passage that appears in this cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2 is from Psalm 69 verse 9. In the Greek Old Testament it's Psalm 68 verse 10 and a quotation appears in John 2 17 of that psalm. Zeal for your house has consumed me and uh, what I'd like you to note is that this psalm is a very important psalm with a number of uh, gospel writers, it's very important in the New Testament, not just here, for understanding Jesus' death. Uh, so the um, psalm relates specifically to the cleansing of the temple, zeal for the house of God, but it also relates to Jesus' death. And so here we have a concern for the house and a concern about Jesus' suffering death. From the psalm as as also in John chapter 2. The connection is made between the zeal for the house and that Jesus will die and uh, then be resurrected in three days. The rest of this verse by the way was also used by Paul in Romans chapter 15 verse 3. Uh, he says the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And he quotes that with reference to Jesus. So both uh, John and Paul are reading Psalm 68 verse 10 from the Septuagint or 69, nine in our Bibles as a reference to uh, Jesus. On this slide, I have the other places where this Psalm features in John's gospel. And so note uh, that where 69.9 is toward the bottom of this table, um, it, where, it, where it occurs in John, uh, it's only in John 2, uh, but then the rest of the places are in John chapter 19, where Jesus is on the cross or in, in his um, passion. Uh, so not all of what's relevant for Jesus' death appears here because I'm only looking at how John uses the psalm, 
other writers will pick up some other verses from this important psalm. Here we have some of the points that are made uh, with respect to this psalm in John's Gospel. There's opposition of the righteous one. Uh, there are lies that are told. There are insults and jeers. There's the passage we've been looking at, zeal for your house has consumed me. There is the poetic imagery that suggests the death of the righteous one. There is the giving of vinegar for drink uh, to Jesus on the cross. There is the uh, idea that let their sacrificial feasts be a trap. John narrates several sacrificial feasts of the Jews. Their sacrifices are replaced in John by a new praise of God through Jesus Christ. And that's also true in Psalm 69, 30 and 31. Uh, they become blind. And then in Psalm 69, 26, we read, for they persecute those whom you have struck down and those whom you have wounded, they attack still more. And finally, the Psalm speaks of judgment and a restoration. A new people is constituted, and we would say with John's Gospel, this new people is constituted in Jesus, replacing the former Israel, but fulfilling God's promise of salvation to his people. And his people is uh, uh, not equivalent to all the Jews, but it doesn't exclude the Jews. And it comes to include the Gentiles as well. So God's people are the Jews and Gentiles in Christ. And uh, there's therefore continuity between Israel and the church, but not identity. Let's just comment on chapter 2, verse 20. It reads as follows. Therefore the Jews said, 46 years, this temple is in the process of being built, and you, Jesus, will raise it up in three days? Now, Josephus helps us here in understanding some dating. In his Antiquities of the Jews, we can uh, see that this event would have taken place in the Passover, uh, at the Passover in AD 28. The temple rebuilding, according to Josephus, started in Herod's 18th year, that would be 20 or 19 BC, uh, this also agrees with Luke. Luke chapter 3, 1 dates the beginning of John the Baptist's ministry in the 15th year of Tiberius. Uh, that would be October 27 to October 28 following the Syrian calendar. The temple was complete in AD 63. So this uh, comment about the building of the temple is a comment not about it took that long, but that it uh, has taken that long and that it's still being built when Jesus talks about its destruction. Note that it was destroyed in AD 70, uh, seven years after it was completed in AD 63. So Jesus' statement about the destruction of the temple at the literal level is a prophecy. Uh, and it's a prophecy that took place in the lifetime of his disciples and of the early church. It was an amazing event. And yet Jesus had already forewarned that that would take place and yet interpreted that future event in light of his own uh, death and resurrection, his replacement then of the temple coming through his death and resurrection. Let's look at the testimony of Scripture and Jesus and the emphasis on faith in this story as well. Let's look at chapter 2, verses 22 and 23. We read, Therefore, when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he was saying this, and they believed the Scripture and the word that Jesus spoke. Notice the emphasis on the testimony that scripture and the teaching of Jesus um, together have. Uh, this is a testimony that agrees, and it is an authoritative testimony for the church. The scripture would be, of course, the Old Testament. And so the word of Jesus is what is new, um, that is uh, 
in agreement with the witness of the scriptures. And then the response is a response of faith. Many believed, we read in verse 23, many believed in his name. The object of belief is Jesus because they saw the signs that he did. This runs throughout John's gospel, especially here and then at the end of John's gospel, this uh, discussion of signs. At the end of John's gospel, the resur resurrected Jesus uh, meets Thomas, the doubting disciple, who will only believe if he sees. And Jesus says to him, blessed are those who believe and do not see. And uh, the, uh, that's immediately followed by the first conclusion to John's gospel uh, in verses 30 and 31, the last two verses of chapter 20. And in those two verses, John says, uh, Jesus did many other signs, but these are given so that you might believe. And so there's a positive relationship between the signs that Jesus does and the belief that they incur and the response of belief. And yet uh, there's also a critique that um, there is uh, more than just looking at signs and coming to faith, but blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. John is suspicious of faith based on signs. It is not wholly bad, of course, but must be developed. And one has to have a stronger basis of faith than just the basis of responding to what they see in signs. Uh, we've seen the positive side of this already, though, in chapter 2, verse 11, where the disciples believe based on the sign that they see of the turning of water into wine in Cana. In conclusion, I would like to ask the question, what have we learned from John 2, verses 12 to 25, about interpreting John's gospel? And I'll bring out four points from this lecture. First, read a pericope or story in John's gospel in relation to the larger section. That is, pay attention to arrangement. Secondly, read a pericope for several points, not just one. There are layers of meaning in John. Thirdly, Old Testament quotes help to identify these points. When we're looking for layers of meaning, we're not on our own, but we get pointers from the text itself. And one of the pointers the text gives us is its quotation or allusion to Old Testament passages. We've seen several that are significant in this passage for John, and that help us to see the multiple points of meaning from this pericope. And then fourthly, we've noted that John is interested in liturgy and worship. The story of the temple cleansing itself is uh, very clearly a story to do with worship. But the arrangement of this story after the story of the um, turning of water into wine uh, is also an indication of his interest in the liturgy or the arrangement of this story before the baptismal story of uh, Nicodemus coming to Jesus in chapter 3 brings uh, Eucharist and baptism together right here at the beginning of John's Gospel. And as we will see in John's Gospel, a number of feasts and festivals are mentioned where Jesus replaces the uh, practices, the festivals of Judaism in himself. And so this is a theme in John's Gospel. We should be looking out for it.